Hey everyone, this is just a quick note to let you know that there are a few issues with the audio in this one where Skype was dropping out a little bit here and there, but we felt like it was still very listenable and we hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash onscript. Welcome back, OnScript listeners. I'm Matt Lynch, a co-host of the podcast, along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, and Chris Tilling. At OnScript, we aim to bring you in on the conversations happening at the center and periphery of biblical studies. This episode brings you into the center, into Pauline anthropology, which impinges on big questions around gender, identity, participatory theology, and much, much more. Aaron Heim and Matt Bates are hosting this interview with Susan Eastman, and we hope you enjoy. The notion of a free and autonomous self pervades popular Western culture. From Polonius's rather haughty to thine own self be true, to Descartes' I think, therefore I am, to Simon and Garfunkel's I am a rock, I am an island, the autonomous self dominates popular understandings of what it means to be human. Against such notions, Susan Eastman claims that there is no freestanding self. The self is always a self in relation to others. Looking at Paul's unusual grammar where the Pauline I is constituted in relation to another, she asks poignant questions like, what kind of agency is implied and exercised by a self that is not solely self-determining? What happens to both freedom and responsibility? What is the role of the body, both individual and social? How do people change? Or do they? And what, if anything, is distinctive about being a person? Hello, OnScript listeners. This is Erin Heim coming to you from Denver Seminary in Littleton, Colorado, where I am an assistant professor of New Testament, and Matt Bates of Quincy University is co-hosting this episode with me. Our guest today is Dr. Susan Eastman, who is associate research professor of New Testament at Duke Divinity School, whose newest book, Paul and the Person, approaches vexing questions of Pauline anthropology by putting them in conversation with two unusual dialogue partners the ancient Stoic philosopher, Epictetus, and modern cognitive and neuroscience. Susan's quest for the Pauline self has taken her far outside the comforts of biblical studies. John Barclay, who wrote the foreword for Susan's book, was surely right to call her an intellectual explorer. I suspect that trailblazer might even be more apt because other brave interdisciplinary minded souls are sure to follow after her with their own expeditions. Susan, we are delighted that you could join us today. Welcome to OnScript. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here. Now, Susan, you've been writing about various aspects of uh, identity in Paul for quite a few years now. How does this newest book, Paul and the Person, fit into your story as a scholar? I, I think that this is, in a way, has been my story as a scholar and human being. Before I became a scholar, I worked as a parish priest in the Episcopal Church. The questions I bring to my scholarly work on Paul, who has always been the one I wanted to work on, arise out of life. And I found when I re-entered the academy that that was kind of novel, that an, uh, ideas for research could arise out of life and not other books. Not that other books aren't important. Um, But I had tried to preach Paul for many years, and uh, questions like how to make sense of I, yet not I, but another, uh, of the death of the self in ways that were not destructive to human beings, interesting questions. So those questions come into my work on Paul. Um, Earlier work, work, I looked at imitation, language in Paul, and it occurred to me that All the Paulines, whether they liked it or not, whether they hated Paul or loved Paul, assumed that imitation is the choice, free choice of an individual. And I thought, that's not how imitation works. Did it win the ancient world? Did Plato think that way? No. So I started researching it. Then I began to realize that modern 
uh, people in neuroscience are very interested in imitation. They don't think it's the free choice of an individual. That's a short answer to the big question. I could tell in reading the book that that might be where your own heart lies, right? Especially thinking about um, implications of this for the church and for people who are in um, uh, all kinds of different human conditions, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's very much the case. Uh, I think that my next work is going to be really exploring that more. And um, I get I get emails from people who are really not in the biblical study guild, um, who have for one reason read the book, and um, who do very different things in terms of sociology, say, or or um, in constitution of the self in American politics. I mean, there are a lot of interesting ways you can push with this, and I find that really fascinating. Yeah. So. What was your motivation to engage the topic of the self as an interdisciplinary conversation? Because it's not just that you're using interdisciplinary um, tools, but the, you put them in conversation with each other, which I just found so creative and inventive and, and just thought-provoking. Uh, what do we gain from that approach? Um, and what do we gain from the way that you've chosen to structure your book? Okay, let me say two things about that. One is in trying to do, um, I structured it as a conversation and intentionally not as, as comparative or, or as sourcing. So this, it's very tricky bringing different disciplines and meditation with each other. And I'm, so I don't want to say that Paul is a stoic, contra some of our, some folks in the field, and I don't want to say that Paul is influenced by stoicism per se. That, Causal influence is very tricky. I want to say that they are asking similar questions, as were all the Hellenistic philosophers and also Jewish thinkers of time. And that contemporary uh, philosophers and scientists are also addressing these burning questions. So I, I've structured a conversation to juxtapose these different voices rather than to draw any lines of influence. Um, I think what is gained uh, is goes in two directions. We get a really fresh reading of Paul by putting him in this conversation instead of recycling the questions and the ways of speaking that get recycled within a, any guild. A guild gets its own sort of closed window, closed room dynamics. And I wanted to open the windows. I just find we get a new new perspectives, new questions arise, new ways of speaking arise. But the other thing we get is a way to bring Paul and let him contribute, Paul's voice contribute, a radical voice, to things like medical ethics. That's really exciting. I confess that uh, one of the things that I do when I'm cooking or getting ready or um, watching my children uh, is, is listen to YouTube lectures. That probably makes me a super nerd. But I listen to YouTube lectures, and I found one from uh, 2016 on Paul and the Person. And it was interesting because you, um, you in that lecture talk about putting Paul into conversation with neuroscience almost as, uh, as a way of being an evangelist. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you mean by being an evangelist in that, in that setting, because that was the word that you used, and I thought that was so interesting. I often hear, and you probably do too, if you're talking with people outside the church or the guild, you say you work on Paul and they look at you. <laughs> and they, like one woman said to me, she said, all I know about Paul is his bad press. It was, it was so weird to her even that here is this woman doing this. So, uh, and they have good reasons for saying that. There's a lot of bad press out there and a lot of ways of reading Paul that I think are destructive. So I think that, um, I find when I address burning questions that we share, I mean, uh, in a talk with, in the medical field, uh, I talked about uh, recently, I talked about the autonomy as a principle of medical ethics. It's, everybody can see there's a problem with autonomy as a principle of medical ethics. It doesn't work in practical situations. But are there other ways of thinking about what that principle is meant to protect. It's meant to protect the agency and worth and dignity of the patient. Can we think about how to do that, but not through the lens of autonomy? Can we open up our imagination? Paul opens up our imagination. People say, oh, that's interesting. Then they might actually be interested in Paul, too. 
That's how it works. Well, since our listeners aren't are likely not all very well versed in Stoic philosophy, can you highlight for us the major contours of Epictetus's view of the self? Oh, okay. Uh, well, the major contours. Okay, let me let me remember all what I wrote here and studied. <laughs> I really like Epictetus. I'll say that he's funny. You know, he's so funny <laughs> and so witty and so smart. Um, but, you know, for Epictetus as a Stoic, the self is on a continuum of being. Everything is on a continuum of being. So there is, on the one hand, a very participatory notion of the person. In all the Stoics, you find that. And some classicists really emphasize that aspect of Stoicism. And so, in that sense, there's great vulnerability of the self. Some people would say there's no self. I don't think so. Because the other fi- thing you find in Stoicism, and in particular in Epictetus, it's very strong, is the notion that the way to a good life is to manage evaluations of impressions. The sensory data, and this is, this is intellectual as well as physical, all data that comes to you, you evaluate it rightly versus wrongly. And you do that through your maintaining your inner citadel, where you have the freedom to say, this is the will of God, which is also the logos that you're on a continuum. It's not, it's not a Christian God or a Jewish God. And uh, this cannot affect my equilibrium. Or you do not do that, and then you've lost your freedom. Freedom is in here or in here. It's in the inner citadel. And that's inalienable, inalienable freedom. Um, in that sense, there's a very strong self. Uh, it's cognitive, it's cognitivist, it's evaluative, um, and it maintains a detachment from all external influences that are not me. My relationships, my body, not me. So in that sense, it's deeply dualistic. So it's very interesting because uh, it straddles these two things. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, one of your major conversation partners in, in terms of scholarship is uh, Charles Ingberg P- Pedersen, um, and uh, he obviously has written a lot on Stoicism and Paul, um, and uh, you find yourself um, frequently, I would say, in disagreement with him, although appreciative of his contribution at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about how you see him mobilizing um, Stoic ideas in relationship to Paul uh, and where you see your sharpest points of disagreement with him. Yeah, I really appreciate Ingberg Peterson because he asks these questions that people just don't ask, like what really is the self here? What it really is going on? Um, and I read a lot of him. And also he really inter- interacts in depth with the class. I mean, he is a player in classicism as much as in New Testament. I read a lot of debates with between Inger, Ingberg Peterson and other classicists as well. So um, that I want to say that. So he mobilizes Stoicism in a, as a way to uh, well, he mobilizes Stoicism as a way to build a bridge with modern science and philosophy, and uh, which he's very much a 20th century. <laughs> um, a scholar in his ways of understanding what modernism is and we moderns, which very Boltmannian excludes any divine causality. In Stoicism, you can have an account of change and of ethics that does not have an external divine causality because they don't have any external divine causality. So Stoicism provides a way to appropriate Paul's ethics in conversation from Peter's, Ingrid Peterson's point of view in conversation with modern thought, both science and scientific and apocalyptic elements of Paul's thought, that he thinks are not amenable to modern thought. That's his project. He's very frank about it. I do not think in Stoicism or in Paul you can separate cosmology and ethics, neither for the Stoics nor for Paul. Their ethics and their cosmology go together, and their cosmologies are very different. Paul, there's an external... Other divine God who acts in history but is not of it, who acts in the world but is not of it. For the Stoics, there is not that otherness. So uh, 
Ingberg Peterson just kind of reads uh, Epictetus as a, as a modern individualistic um, free will thinker. And uh, I don't read him that way, and I certainly don't read Paul that way. That's, a, that's more could be said, but that might yeah, be enough it, for now. Within Stoicism, there's a sort of panentheistic strand to it, right? Oh, yeah. Where, um, uh, that has implications for what the self can mean. And um, it, if I was to summarize at least what it seemed like you were doing, it, it seems like you were um, you were um, calling into question Ingrid Peterson's um, construal of of the self as as something that's sort of um, a default, you know, um, move back to Descartes and to sort of a. Um, uh, a, a modern construction of the self that does that, that doesn't really appreciate how the panentheism sort of might color um, stoicism and not color Paul, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think Paul's an apocalyptic thinker, and I think Ingrid Peterson just says, "Well, like Boltmont, well, we can't we can't think that way today, so we're just going to leave that out." He knows Paul's apocalyptic. Ingrid Peterson does, but he thinks that's not something we can bring into our conversation today. Yeah, and for those listeners who may not be aware, we're talking about um, Ingberg Peterson's book, primarily Cosmology and the Self and the Apostle Paul, although he's written other books as well that was published by Oxford in oh, like 2010-ish, um, and which has been a major book discussed in our field. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know that all listeners would be aware. Yeah. Speaking of the panentheistic tendencies of Stoicism, uh, the Stoic view of the self with its turn inward and its shunning or at least subduing, especially the emoti- emotional and affective elements of a person, that actually seems to have a lot of cultural resonances in some circles today, and including, I think, some Christian circles. What do you think is the danger of that? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, well... There are many dangers <laughs> of that in obvious pastoral ways, psychological ways. That the, but it's also just not true to reality. Uh, I think there are ways of understanding Christian life that are very stoic. They suggest that if you just think right, they're very cognitivist. And if you just think the right thoughts, then everything will follow. Uh, there are two problems with that. One is that if... Uh, in Paul's theology and Christology, which in my view cannot be separated from his anthropology at all, they all go together, uh, God is the one who is acting without an if. <laughs> there are no preconditions to God's action in Christian life. And so uh, that if you just think right is problematic. And then it ignores, to ignore the way in which um Affect and thought are mutually influential is problematic. Um, Paul, contrary to the Stoic pictures of Paul, is really emotional. He expresses emotion a lot in uh, his letters. He expresses his vulnerability. His body is a means of communicating that vulnerability, which is part of the way in which he communicates the crucified Christ. So his vulnerability and his proclamation of Christ crucified go together. If he were a slick TV evangelist, which had its analogs in the ancient world, the slick, handsome, polished orator that Paul was not, he would not be truthfully communicating the gospel of Christ crucified. And he deploys that all the time. He is emotional. He is anxious. He is almost despairing, and all of that turns into a way that he points to God's sufficiency rather than his own competence. So a great deal is at stake here. Yeah, I appreciate your the, the fact that you, you're so careful to integrate the cognitive with the affective with the embodied experience of Paul, because when I read Paul, I see those same... Um, those same integrations. I, I just I just finished teaching a class on Romans 12, uh, where my students sometimes get stuck on. Well, Paul says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then they don't read the rest of the passage where the renewing of the mind leads to uh, interpersonal communication, and it leads to empathy, and it leads to worship, uh, which are bodily expressions, which are emotive expressions. So I just I really appreciate that. Um, 
your anthropology gives us a, another tool in the toolbox to, to look at texts like that and, and explain them in a more holistic and integrated way. Thank you. That's the idea. <laughs> Let me say one more thing. It also means that um, in practical terms, for the ministry of the church, it can be far more inclusive of those with cognitive impairments. I think that in relationship to God, we are all cognitively impaired. Romans makes that very clear. But I think that people who are, yeah, are nonverbal, you know, uh, this this becomes far more inclusive and um, allows them to have gifts for the life of the church. Yeah, just that. Hmm. Well, if you don't mind, Susan, um, we like to do a couple speed rounds. Maybe I'll do one with you now, and uh, we'll have Aaron do one with you later. And the idea with these speed rounds is that we ask you uh, questions that usually are a little bit broader, um, uh, but uh, the idea is that you, you just kind of reflexively answer. You don't really get to defend your answer uh, more than just a, maybe a line or two, um, and uh, we just kind of get to hear what you think. Um, what do you think? Are you, are you ready for this? I, I guess. We'll just see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, what's a what's a trend in society that scares you? Mm. The uh, the the extreme use of internet replacing face to face embodied human interactions. What's something you find embarrassing? This interview right here now. <laughs> 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 We've never had anyone say that. That's funny. Uh, uh, so you don't you don't like to be put on the public spotlight, I suppose. Then oh, that's funny. Uh, all right. Well, how about maybe this one will be more in your orb than of comfort. Um, this is a hard question, though. Um, what's the most important theology or biblical studies book of the last fifty years? J. Lewis Martin's commentary on Galatians. Oh, wow. I, I, haven't, I don't think we've had anyone say that one yet. It's obviously a classic in our field and very, very important. So it's surprising that someone hasn't, actually. But I yes, think it, it might is. be the first. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, does intelligent alien life exist elsewhere in the universe? Entirely uh, possible. Entirely possible. Now, entirely. this gets in... This gets into your um, maybe into your in your book and your the sort of cognitive science angle, but uh, is it possible then for a robot to have consciousness? Would you think? I, you know, I went to. I give a long com- answer to that. Yeah, you can give a long one. That's yeah, it's it's right online with your book. Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, go for it. I went to a conference. I spoke at a conference in Cambridge on um, artificial intelligence and uh, theological anthropology. So these things came up a lot, you know, and um, I was more interested in what robots do to our self-understanding because when we think in terms of robots and what it means in making robots human-like, we reduce our notion of human-like. Is it possible for a robot to help self-consciousness? I doubt it. It's just a set of algorithms, really. The computer scientists in the room kept saying, no, these are just algorithms, Forget all these questions. <laughs> I um, I have seen, uh, you know, there are these robots that look completely human, cry, have human hair, uh, do all the, their, their eyes blink at the right time. Uh, there are robots programmed to give lectures and to lead seminars, and they look they're they're total androids, but they are all being controlled from somewhere else. Uh, some people would disagree with me on this. But it's not the most urgent yeah. question to me. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So I mean, um, so you don't see the idea of uh, of mind then arising from silicon uh, in any kind of way? No, because I think of mind as embodied and socially embedded, and therefore the uh, a mind in a vat, a mind uh, that's made up simply of of uh, you know, I don't even know the technology for this doesn't make sense to me. Now, there are people building robots and artificial intelligence that are responsive to the environment and supposedly can learn. You know, this is the big new thing. Robots can learn from their environment. Um, but they're a long way behind human beings. Sure. It gets into the questions that, like, and you raised some of this of mirror, mirror neurons and things like that, right? And that, that's sort of what they're trying to imitate, I think, in some of these, um, you know, these robots where, um, you know, with a mirror, uh, mirror neuron, the best I understand any of the cognitive science behind all of this, you know, the, the idea is essentially that um, whenever we see some, see an external uh, object or person, 
um, this triggers two sets of neurons in our bodies, ones, ones that are imitative and ones that involve our own action. Uh, so there's sort of an, an empathy charge, uh, you know, between um, and resonance between those sets of neurons in our own body, in our own brains. Uh, and I think the idea would be that within these robots, they're trying to, to imitate mirror neurons and things like that. Um, it's a very interesting field, right? And I don't, I don't know how I would answer my own question. Um, I'm just, that's, I guess that's why I wanted to ask it. Is I, w- I was interested. You've thought a lot about these things. But, well, I let me br- briefly answer. say, because I've learned from neuroscientists to be extremely cautious about any claims about neuroscience and mirror neurons, uh, which uh, trigger, I mean, the, the, the classic uh, experiment was in Italy when these Italian scientists who had these, these primates, brains wired, noticed that the, it was the, uh, the motor neuron that fired when seeing the appropriate motor neuron and seeing the scientists do something, the appropriate motor neuron activated fire. That meant blood went to it. That meant that, you know, when, when, when the primate saw an action. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that a lot of claims are made in the name of neuroscientists, science that neuroscientists themselves are really cautious about. So I've learned to be much more cautious about that. Just a word, just a word of wise. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's an, there's a, yeah, there's a new book out called uh, The Myth of there are, Modern, um, uh, There are many books like neurons, that out there, which I have not read. Written by scientists. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I know it's debated. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, uh, one other thing. There are um, uh, books that want to, uh, and studies that want to use neuroscience to evaluate and explain, quote, religious experience. There's a book on Paul who tries to do this, Paul's real experience when he, you know, went to the third heaven and all of this. Um, I, I think that's not wise. I don't think we explain, we, we don't have a category of experience that we can call religious experience separate from all experience. If God is with us at all times, all experience is religious experience, not just trances or individualistic private experiences, other out of body experiences, the things people mean. So I think I, I, I myself endorse attempts to explain religious, quote, religious experience, close quote via neuroscience to try to locate the God neuron or whatever. Just, I just hmm. don't. There's a lot of that out there. Uh, uh, I personally am not. not a yeah. Well, it's super helpful to hear your thoughts on it as I think you've thought more deeply about this. Um, you know, it's, at least as a theologian, um, you've thought more deeply about it than many, many others have. And, and I think that's, that's helpful. How about I do one more speed round question and we'll turn it back over to Aaron here. All right. So your last one. No, no, it's okay. I, I, I I'm so glad you took us down that rabbit trail. Um, so here, here it is. This is really important too. Uh, what, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? You know, I didn't. Uh oh. Sorry. All right. Now, <laughs> that's well, not good. you know, I, I, I won't be your dietitian or your doctor, and I won't um, condemn you for this, as I, I think I ate. Yeah, but I didn't take care of my body. I ate cashews <laughs> and a piece of uh, old pizza, so you know, I wasn't doing. I'm a coffee either. for breakfast person. I can't. It like first meal of the day before noon. It just throws my whole day off. <laughs> Moving back into the book. Uh, in your chapter on contemporary neurocognitive science, you conclude by saying that philosophers of science and experimental psychologists agree that a person is, and now I'm going to quote you, irreducibly embodied and socially and environmentally embedded. This model of the self is intersubjective all the way down. The Cartesian idea of an individual freestanding independent self is long gone. So how do modern scientific approaches take us to that conclusion many ways uh that's a big question this is not a speed round question no (laughs) um i think everything from uh studying the activity of mirror neurons or, or neurons period period um to studies of infants developmental studies of infants uh a lot of I, I did a whole thing on imitation and infant imitation. I have since learned it has since been proven that neonates cannot be proved to imitate, but still by six 
to eight months, infants are imitating. And now people are theorizing that they imitate because they learn to imitate by the fact that their parents imitate them on an average of twice a minute or twice, something like that, something absurd. Um, so careful observation of infant development. This stuff has been around in psychology already. Um, and and the, the mutual influence. Uh, these are also ways in which uh, science is thinking, rethinking the idea of the um, starting with an individual who then becomes attached. People start attached. Uh, I'm not sure where to begin with this. It's it's all over. In the in the continent on uh, in philosophy, there is something called the second person perspective, which I talk about in the book. It's not as prevalent in the U.S., but philosophers and sociologists and um, psychologists and scientists thinking about, um, as one sociologist put it to me, the diet is the basic unit of investigation. That was how a sociologist put it to me. It's, there are these movements. Uh, that's not, a, it's hard to know where to start. Yeah. Mm, mm, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I want to make sure that we do is um, is sort of ground us in the details of our, our biblical text at some point is obviously you're really working on Paul and the person, and there's a couple t- uh, key texts that you you, um, you spend some time on there, Romans 7, uh, Galatians 2, uh, the Philippians hymn. Um, and I was wondering if you could take um, one of those, whichever one you think is most convenient f- uh, for your own sake or um, that you think is most illustrative, um, to talk about how it is that we see something more than the individual ego, the individual I, um, and we see something of this um, second person, um, uh, the second person dimension uh, to those texts. Because I think you, you actually are reading the text with great care on an exegetical level, um, and I want um, – I want uh, listeners to get a sense of how you're dealing with the, the fine-grained details of those texts. So could you lead us through one of those? Um, I know I'm pushing you for detail, um, and uh, if, you're, if, if you don't have that detail readily to mind, uh, that's okay too. Um, but, if, but if you can, that could be helpful, or maybe I could read something out of the book if you don't have anything ready to mind. I'll, I'll talk about Romans 7. This seems to be the most um, uh revolutionary in a way for folks um, in general reading Paul. In Romans 7, Paul famously says, he says it twice, if I do what I do not want, it is not I doing it, but sin that dwells in me. Uh, people have read Romans 7 uh, as a division within the self, as two parts of the self, as the, uh, the, uh, the problem of the self not having the freedom to do what it wants to do. Um, there is, on the one hand, an ego, clearly, in Romans 7. There's an I, and that I still acts. There's an I that acts, I do, what I do not want to do, um, and that observes itself, that laments, that speaks. Lots of debates on who this I is. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, sin, by this point in the letter, is acting as a noun that is the subject of active verbs. And in fact, if you trace the language of sin through Romans, what you find is that a few times earlier in the letter, it occurs as a noun with humans doing the action, humans sinning. Not very often. Fairly soon, it becomes uh, a noun that acts. Uh, I have already charged that all are under sin, says Paul in Romans 3. Um, in Romans five twelve, sin enters the world as an active agent along with death. And thereafter, sin is an agent that is subjecting human beings, ruling. And by the time you get to Romans 7, sin is doing and accomplishing the evil that Paul says human beings accomplish in uh, Romans 1. So it's a very interesting thing where sin seems to take over human action. So what I note in Romans 7 is that uh, Paul is not locating the problem in the ego per se, but in the sin that dwells is indwelling. So he's, everybody wants to talk about Romans 7 and the law and Paul exonerating the law. It is true that Paul drives a wedge between sin and the law. In, but he also makes them very, very complicit at the same time. 
um, the law is taken over and used by sin to deceive and to kill. But then he also drives a wedge between the ego that wants the good, the I that wants the good, and sin that dwells in me and accomplishes evil. And in doing so, Paul, um, I think, is having a constitution of the self, an I, yet not I, but another. Parallels Galatians 2, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I, yet not I, but Christ in me. In Romans 7, it's I, yet not I, but sin in me. Parallel construction of the self is an I, yet not I, but another in me, and yet there's still an I operative. But that I is is not not a free agent in Romans 7. It's an I whose agency defined as the capacity to accomplish what one sets out to do. That I's agency has been evacuated and taken over by sin as a hostile power that is alien to the deepest desires of the self. This maintains a very positive notion of the self as, as desiring God and desiring the good, but, but held captive uh, uh, by sin as an indwelling agent and also a realm of existence. Paul talks about sin in both those ways. I find this notion of sin as a noun that operates on, in, and through human beings, their embodied interpersonal interactions, uh, that really changes things for people. That really changes their understanding of a lot of stuff. It's, so that that's, um, I mean, I could say more about it, but that's a start on Romans 7, paying careful attention to the text. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's, that's very articulate and powerful. Um, yeah, and I, I think... Um, you, on the one hand, do a beautiful job of showing how sin is sort of a, a, an agent alongside the eye and um, in, in such a way that the eye isn't an eye alone, right? Um, and then the other hand, and especially in the Galatians text and the Philippians text, you really show that the Christ narrative, um, that it's really a participatory um, – there's, there's a strongly participatory dimension, right, to um, – uh, to understanding what the self means uh, in Christ, uh, that you're really working along um, that trajectory too, um, and I'm wondering as sort of a compliment to what you've just said. Uh, one of the things that struck me, I guess, as you were as you were speaking, that could be really helpful for the church and how we think about anthropology, is um, and I don't remember where you said this. It might have been toward the end of the book, but you said something along the lines of if the church was to be uh, to to stop thinking about the creation narrative as sort of the primary locus of what it means to be human. Uh, and was to instead start thinking about uh, the incarnation narrative, um, the Christ hymn narrative, Christ master, the master story, as, as as Michael Gorman puts it, right? That Philippians hymn he wants to call the master story, um, 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 making that central to what it means to be fundamentally human. Um, that we would maybe be in a better starting place for thinking about our own humanity. Um, could you tease that out and maybe tease out more, I guess, the participatory dimension of the text? Now, you could go right into some really um, heavy-hitting textual details, as you wish, or you could speak more broadly. Yeah. Uh, I think that in, in theological debates around theological anthropology, uh, the, the Imago Dei in Genesis has been the go-to. Uh, the, one of the problems with that in, in practice has been that then the Imago Dei is imagined in particular ways <laughs> and um, that end up somehow or other excluding somebody or other from the Kapak, from the Imago. They're not relational enough. The Imago Dei is relational. And, what, and so an autistic person that does not seem to be relational, although they are in their own ways, doesn't fit, you know. So, uh, or the Imago Dei has been understood in terms of creativity or rationality or language. And so... Uh, but that's not my my starting point is that Paul uh, goes to for Paul, the Imago Dei is in Christ. <laughs> Christ is the Imago Dei. So Paul is always Christological in his starting point. So I'm going with Paul here. And uh, and what that means is that one looks to Christ to understand who is included in the category person. And. Christ became a human in Philippians 2. Not only did he take human form, but he took on the form of a slave. Uh, and he uh, was not only killed or died, but he was crucified. And so what Paul does in the depiction of, of Christ, in the Christ hymn, is emphasize the... Um, extreme 
liminality of Christ of the incarnation. It is not, you know, simply human. It's in the form of a slave. That's a that's very liminal status in terms of personhood in the ancient world. <laughs> and um, crucified, the most horrific but also demeaning and shameful reserved for those of liminal status kind of execution in the ancient world. And so if we take the Christ him depicting not in the first instance an imita- an example to follow, which then can become really problematic. <laughs> but we take it in the first instance as Christ's participation in the realm of human dereliction at its most extreme and liminal state in the Roman Empire. Participation is first divine participation. It's not that I, my individual self, freely choose to participate in Christ, to participate in the church. No, it's that God chose to participate in human existence in an embodied liminal way. That then exalts all humanity and tells us that everybody is, everybody, every homo sapiens is included in the category human because Christ became incarnate in that form. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of how I, I think about that. So the movement, for me, the Christ hymn is about the movement of God into human history and then a uh, mutually participatory movement of humanity um, into the divine images as revealed in Christ. I call it allied agency. God allies God's self with our human agency. Yeah. Is that helpful? Does that give the idea? A little bit. Yeah. It changes the way the church preaches. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, I feel like you're channeling a little Maximus the Confessor there as uh, that very strong, strong uh, emphasis on the incarnation. And uh, we wouldn't want to go to say uh, that 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 sort of divinizes all creation, but uh, maybe we don't want to use that quite quite that language. uh, But there's a sense in which um, our humanity is dignified through that for sure. yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it is. Yeah, I really appreciated the your definition of a person and that you gave in the book is one for whom Christ died. And I think that has some profound just I mean it's such an inclusive phrase and then it's just it's such a profound theological statement. I found I found that to be one of the most helpful um takeaways from the book. I mean it was such a small thing, but it was just a profound profound way of phrasing that. Small but it big. It is it's huge. It's huge. It also, I say one thing, you know, in debates about what makes human beings different from animals, you know, (laughs) which I also get into with scientists and stuff, uh, you know, the incarnation gives us a way to think about what makes human beings uh, unique uh, without it being capacities based, without it being about rationality or language, which dolphins have language, you know, all of those things, those, those little markers of, quote, humanity actually break down with certain animal groups. Now, it might be that God has been become incarnate as a dolphin. There's no way I would know. <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. What I know is that God became incarnate as a human being. And that is what gives it, makes us unique. It, it, really, it really helps in lots of um, philosophical issues, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Susan, let's do another speed round. And I'm going to do this one. And my questions are probably equally quirky or hopefully hopefully less quirky than Matt's, but we'll see. If you could be any animal in the world, what would you be? Besides human? Right. <laughs> we are. I am an animal. I think I'd like to be a Canada goose. Oh. <laughs> they mate for life. They travel long distances. They see the world. And they chase runners and hiss at them, not, you know, speaking from personal experience or anything. (laughs) Where is somewhere you've always wanted to travel that you've not traveled yet? Antarctica. Do you have any hidden talents? Uh, I play the piano, but not terribly well. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Want to be early bird. <laughs> See, if I have young children. I just don't sleep anymore. <laughs> yeah, I remember those years. Yeah. Uh, if you were coming to my house for dinner, what's one thing 
that you hope that I won't serve you? Lima beans. Everybody has bean things. Paul Trebilko said said no broad beans. Beans must be the yeah. I, I... <laughs> you but not lima beans. You... <laughs> not lima beans. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll try to remember that. Uh, mountains or ocean? Mountains. Mm. In fact, Colorado. In fact, Southwest Colorado. The sands, to be precise. Mm. That's a wonderful area of the state. Yeah, we spent my family spends a lot of time there when we're when we're able to. Uh, and what's one thing? The final question: What's one thing that you wish all your incoming PhD students knew? Mm. How to do exegesis really well. How to read a text and parse it out. Exegesis, exegesis, exegesis. Carl Bart said that. It's hard, it's hard to argue with that, for sure. It's hard to argue with that. It's all about the text, right? Um, I, I'll say one more thing. You know, uh, they don't need to compete with each other. It'll be okay. <laughs> you me, the first year or two of doctoral work are just really hard psychologically. All right, well um, – Mm. Here, here was sort of a, you know, a, one of these fun theological puzzles, you know, that um, I, your book didn't make entirely unique to me, but sort of raised it afresh. Um, and uh, especially because whenever we begin to think of the self as embodied and relationally constituted, um, obviously this raises questions about our own unique responsibility for sin before God. Um, and uh, if, you know, sin is a socially mediated power then, um, not something that's just a you know, something that's self-determined, right? Um, how then can God maintain his justice uh, on the individual level as he judges us uh, at the final judgment? Yeah, that is a big, big question, and it always comes up, absolutely. Uh, and I say one of the ways I talk about this is to say that we are complicit in sin uh, because I do think that there is – we have a co-constituted agency. We are not free agents. We are not free not to sin apart from the work of God in us. But we are complicit in it at the same time. Oh, it's just so you're so articulate. I mean, I'm just I'm so impressed with with how you're, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to mentally uh, you know sort of trying to mentally ingrain that in my head so I can spit it back to my students. Uh, I really like that. I think also that. Sin itself ultimately is judged on the cross. So Romans 8. You know what happens is in Romans 1 through 7, that sin is a lot there. And then in Romans 8, there's a little bit about sin because God condemned sin on the cross, embodied in the person of Jesus. God made Christ to be sin. I mean, this is really amazing. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, and then sin drops out of the language. It drops out of the vocabulary of Romans after that. It's really striking. I think that um, we are complicit with sin. We are like, uh, I use, often use the imagery, others have used this, of a colonized country with an oppressive colonizing power that colonizes the subjectivities of the people. We have colonized subjectivities. Uh, but at the same time, we, um, our, our dignity in part depends on our being judgeable. I think also that in Christ, it might be it might be that we become judgeable, we become uh, capable of judgment because our agency is liberated in relationship to Christ. Paul certainly talks about judgment within the community. He does this in First Corinthians, for example. He talks about uh, the person who builds wrongly on the foundation. The, of Christ and they will be judged their works will burn up and they will but they will still be saved but as through fire there is judgment of deeds there is judgment of works um, I'm not sure there's judgment of Christians uh, and I think there's a lot more work to be done on this in Paul? I think this is a ching-ching, do this project. The language of judgment in Paul needs to be disentangled uh, and slowly to the way John Barclay disentangled the language of grace. I think the language of judgment needs a lot more work um, in Paul. But there is judgment, but then 
there's also this, I, I'm not sure if we're fully judgeable under sin, but we are complicit in it. Does that make some sense? I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely it does. And I, you, you're sort of just causing all kinds of, you know, uh, lights to flash in my mind of, of different directions I would like to go. Um, for the sake of time, we can't go everywhere. But it certainly, when you talked about the colonizing dimension of um, how our selves are constituted uh, by uh, in relationship to sin, um, certainly made me think about demonic oppression um, and and that category, which is obviously a difficult category as we sort of are trying to interface that with with modern science too. Um, do you see a connection there, or am I making things up? You mean, is Paul thinking about demons? Do you mean that specifically? Yeah, or um, I guess as I was trying to move to when you, when you speak about sin and its colonizing dimension, is a, is a further um, uh, dimension of that the demonic, or is it an extension of it in some way? Is there a way in which you would draw that out, or is, is this just something that I um, – and fanciful about, um, as I was trying to make that connection in my own head. And it's okay if you think I'm crazy. Um, I might be. I was just thinking. I don't think crazy at all. I've I've pondered this too. Okay. Okay, I, I, I think that's again, um, Paul and the demonic. Paul does not. You know the, the the gospel full of the language of demons. Paul is not. He uses the language of sin. He will speak about Satan. I think he believes in a Satan. I think you know. I think that. Um, but but he seems to almost have have uh, could we say he's demythologized it? I don't know. I'm aware of that word. But he is he prefers to use the language of sin. But sin, at least at least penultimately, operates as a cosmic power. Penultimately, within the larger purposes of God, God has shut up all under sin that he might have, or all you know in. Until Christ came, Scripture shut up all sin. God has shut up all under disobedience. These different ways of speaking. God is always finally powerful, but sin has this has this colonizing and oppressive, but penultimate role in which He almost speaks of it as a cosmic power. It is other than the self. It is other than human beings. It is not generated by human beings. This gets tricky because this language is slippery here we have sort of two accounts paul has paul says god has handed us over into these powers um i think that this has a lot of traction without necessarily using the language of demonic in all kinds of um situations for example with addictions or with with uh, different kinds of disorders where it's as if the agency of the person is taken over and um, they're trying to do something good, and they're they're killing themselves. Anorexia uh, can be talked about in this way. I've, I've done that. In parallels to the way Paul talks about sin, do we want to talk about this as as demonic? Sometimes. Do you know the book? Shall I go on, or you want me to stop? Okay. There's a book. I use this in an article uh, I wrote. That's well. It's published in a festschrift on the empire of illusion and sin in, in Paul. Um, and it's Andrew Del Banco. It's called The Death of Satan. It's a, He's a sociologist, I guess. It's not a Christian book at all. It's not a theological book. It's a fabulous book. So useful. He talks about how people used to ascribe evil to Satan, but in our modern American culture, we don't believe in Satan. And he talks about the effects of the loss of that belief. Uh, because where are you going to locate evil? If you know, how are you going to explain it if you don't have Satan? Well, you explain it by demonizing other people. You locate evil in human beings, and then you locate evil in people groups, and then you try to eradicate it. <laughs> we can see this happen all over the place. Or we locate evil in ourselves, and we hate ourselves, and we try to eradicate ourselves. Um, so... So there are many ways to talk about this and even quote the demonic because people don't have a way to explain evil and yet need a way to wrestle with it. Uh, Paul's language tends to be the language of sin as a power. And that's it's some reflections yeah, on it. Yeah. Um, but I think there's much more yeah. to be done on yeah, that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think you're right. That is his dominant language. Although he does, you know, in First Corinthians ten, you know, talk about you know not participating. Yeah, in the that's females, right. You know, in, in terms of these alternative, there are a couple places, but I think you're right. It is interesting to see that. Um, certainly, he seems to see that colonizing dimension of sin, and, and perhaps maybe um, 
uh, does see it connected and handing over to the powers or whatnot. You one know, one other thing doing. is that, you know, we scholars and so forth don't think in these ways, but I mean, have, I've worked as a pastor where people wanted me to do exorcisms. I mean, in the popular mentality out there, especially in the West, I will say, more than the East, I mean, go to go to the Northwest. There's a lot of this. Uh, there's a lot of belief in demons. Yeah, just that. <clears throat> Can I ask one more question <laughs> before Matt ends? Uh, so the crux of your book really is that the self is self in relation, either self in Paul in relation to sin or self in relation to Christ. And at one point you say that, um, I'm going to quote you again, there is no need to posit some abstract, essential, self-reflective and continuous I rather bonded with its environment, the whole self lives or dies with that matrix, that matrix being the self in relation to sin or the self in relation to Christ. And you go on and then talk about continuity and discontinuity. And there's a lot about discontinuity in the book. And I'm wondering, in what sense do you see continuity of the self between maybe those two matrices, if there is continuity at all? Yeah, yeah, big, big topic. Um, I think that our continuity is held by God. I get this from Ernst Kesemann, for the biblical scholars out there, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> who I think is brilliant on these topics. Um, so I think that instead of a, an isolated, discrete, core self, uh, I think there is that the this, this self in relation is held by God. And so there is how we find continuity. Now, the way this works in Paul's own self-narration in Galatians, I don't do this a lot in this book, but I've done it in my earlier book. I'll put in a plug. Paul's mother tongue. Um, Paul narrates his life in Galatians as radical discontinuity when, when God apocalypsed his son in him. And yet, as he then reflects, he says that this same God uh, had called him from his mother's womb, using prophetic imagery. So the continuity is that this apocalypse of Christ in Paul's life connected him to God's calling of him from before he was born. There is a, a, a extreme continuity there, and yet on the human experiential level, it's great discontinuity. And I just find that really helpful. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's not a full answer to your question because it's a really thorny issue that I needs more f and further discussion. But that's a short answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I, I get a final question, too, and I want to ask a question. Um, I think it's very clear your heart is for the church and for the world. Um, and um, I think that this book has implications for church and world, but I want to hear what you think the most important ones are. If, if you see this, if you were to hope, uh, your, speak to your hopes for this book, for how it's going to get mobilized in the church, um, where do you think it's most urgent? I think that <clears throat> the primary point of the book, probably of my work theologically, is the priority of God's initiative. And so how that relates to identity is that identity is always gifted. It's always gifted, and it's divinely gifted. If it's humanly gifted, it can be taken away, and we have lots of examples of that in human history uh, on individual and global levels. But it is divinely gifted, and that divine gift, which is grace, is what constitutes our worth and our personhood. When the church understands this, it stops nagging people. Uh, understanding the, the corollary, corollary of that is that uh, we don't think in terms of free individual free will, which is taken as axiomatic in almost all forms of Christianity in American culture. And it's, it, it, <clears throat> power, it's powerless. And it's destructive <laughs> to be strong. I want people to uh, realize that, as my colleague Richard Hayes likes to say, it's about God, stupid. And uh, <laughs> I think that it's um, that priori priority of divine gift and grace 
when the church understands that, it really becomes powerful for uh, in, in, in myriad ways. Uh, and w- that bleeds into the culture in terms of how we treat people. Very short answer, but that's what I'll say. Yeah, well, there, there we have it. The, the self and our humanity is divinely yeah. gifted. Um, I love it. Well, Susan, um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really a pleasure for us so to fun. have you with us today to speak with you. Uh, your, your book is absolutely terrific. Uh, we hope listeners will be compelled to dive into your arguments. Great. Themselves. Thank you. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yeah. 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 So thank you. This is Aaron Heim and Matthew Bates for On Script. Today we've been speaking with Susan Grove Eastman about her new book, Paul and the Person, Reframing Paul's Anthropology, published by Erdman's. There's a link on our website, www.onscript.study. Until next time, thanks for listening. You have been listening to On Script, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.